Okay. So um, today I'm going to be talking about e-commerce outlook in 2018, emerging trends and how they could uh, impact your business. This is from coming from information that I hear from the different brands and manufacturers that I work with. Um, this comes from information that I talk to people at conferences. This comes from information that I've read articles myself. So it's kind of all of the information I'm hearing here is kind of where I see the trends going. So. So as uh, Meg Lowe was nice enough to say, I'm Will Turnland. Um, you guys have seen me around in a bunch of weird little places. I'm on uh, every Amazon website possible. I try to contact them and get involved some way. Um, if you don't know who I am at all, I started selling full time in 2013. From there, me and my brother, working out of my family's excess warehouse space, grew our Amazon account to $10 million a year with less than two years. Everything was going well besides my lifestyle. I was not enjoying myself. I was living in, in a warehouse, picking and packing, helping people, managing stuff. It was miserable. And so as brands contacted us more and more saying, hey, we want to work with you guys. We want to sell your products. Uh, we want to work with you guys. We want you to sell our products on Amazon. They started coming to us more and more saying, actually, we want to get on Amazon. We want to work with you guys, but we want to sell under our own Amazon account, not your guys' Amazon account. And so that's where I spun off and started Go Consulting. Go Consulting, we run the brands of manufacturers and brands. Um, we, sorry, we run the Amazon account for manufacturers and brands ranging from publicly traded companies to startups. And so if you want to sell on Amazon and you want to sell through your own account, you'd go through our Go Consulting. If you just want to get on Amazon and you want someone else to do everything for you, you'd sell to my brother. So that's kind of the state of where I'm at right now. So, e-commerce in 2018. An interesting thing when doing research about e-commerce in 2018 and beyond, most people only focused on mobile. So you can see right here how basically PC commerce is starting to kind of go flat and mobile commerce is starting to go up and up. I know plenty of kids my age who don't even own a laptop. They only own a smartphone. So the only way they're ever going to buy stuff online is mobile. And I see that's going to be a trend moving forward more and more. And so whoever can do the best on mobile and make their um, products the most available on mobile and the easiest to buy on mobile is probably going to be the most successful. So that's going to be one of the trends as we go through. So why would someone shop online? Why, um, why is it beneficial to shop online? Why do shoppers prefer online? Well, first, a variety of products. Um, I can tell you firsthand, I was walking around Hong Kong yesterday, and I went to the Adidas store. Saw a pair of shoes that I might like, and I thought to myself, OK, this is great and all, but this Adidas store only has two different color combinations of this style of shoe. I know if I go online, there's going to be 100 different styles of this shoe online and all different color combinations. And then if I buy it in the store, I'm kind of missing out on the majority of the products that are offered by this company. And so one of the main reasons people shop online is they want to see the entire stock, they want to see every SKU that the brand sells, and they want to be able to shop around a lot more than they can in a traditional brick and mortar store. Another thing that people prefer about online shopping is the one-click checkout. If you guys have not heard recently, Amazon's patent on the one-click checkout runs out this year. And so that's going to be a big focus, I think, for all the rest of the other e-commerce marketplaces moving forward, is adding some sort of one-click or one-touch checkout to their order. I know many of people who I talk to who are totally not in the Amazon sphere, people like my parents, friends, and, all, and kind of random people who say the one-click checkout is addictive. They get addicted to it. They're constantly buying stuff. Um, you guys seen the South Park episode making fun of Amazon? All of the guys think that their uh, wives are having affairs with the UPS drivers because they keep showing up to their house saying, well, I didn't know what I ordered on Amazon. I don't know what's coming. And they go, well, why do these UPS guys keep showing up at our house? So it's kind of the one-click checkout. You can get amnesia real quick, buy a bunch of stuff, not even realize it, and it shows up at your door the next day. Another reason people prefer online shopping, low prices. People want low prices. It's pretty obvious why. Amazon, among Walmart, Jet, all these different e-commerce marketplaces are making the world become flat and making it so there's kind of an open playing field for everyone. So whoever can provide the lowest price is going to win. 
There's no longer these kind of artificial monopolies where you're the only distributor in the Midwest of the US, you're the only one who can supply these stores of the products so you can set the price. That doesn't exist anymore, the world's become flat, prices are getting lower. And last, one of the reasons why people love shopping online, fast and free, on, uh, fast and free shipping. In Minneapolis, where I'm from, we have uh, Amazon Prime Now, which is two hour shipping. I know that they have 30 minute shipping in like New York City, and it's getting faster and faster. And so if you can deliver something, if someone can order a gallon of milk on their way home from work, and it shows up at their door before they get home, and they don't have to stop at the store, that can be a huge um, kind of benefit to the consumer. So I'm gonna go through the different e-commerce marketplaces and kind of explain where they're going and the pluses and minuses of each e-commerce marketplace. And then we're gonna kind of break down at the end which one seemed the best overall. So first and foremost is walmart.com. So Walmart says that their sales are gonna grow 40% on e-commerce in 2019. Uh, we can't take that as fact, but they're probably pretty accurate. On top of that, um, Walmart doesn't have the same conflicts of interest that like Amazon does. And so Walmart recently teamed up with the Google um, Smart Home, their Alexa version, and now if you try to order something through your Google um, device, it will be ordered from walmart.com. And so they're doing a pretty good job of kind of getting themselves out there. We talked about at the Mastermind earlier today, how aggressive Walmart's been at trying to attract new sellers to their marketplace. And as they attract new sellers, sellers bring competition price-wise. When prices go down, consumers get happy and the consumers follow afterwards. So the more sellers they can get on their marketplace, the better, and they're doing a pretty good job being very aggressive about that. On top of that, Walmart has acquired a logistics startup called Parcel, that's in New York City. They um, basically are looking to do fast, one hour, two hour shipping, just like Amazon's doing, and so they're acquiring all these different um, shipping companies and parcel companies to make sure that they can be as competitive as possible. I'm not exactly sure why Walmart is just not doing this internally. It seems like each one of their storefronts could easily turn into a distribution center and they could just do it locally like that, but for some reason, just like acquiring Jet, they think it's better to acquire than build it their own and they probably have more information than I do. Um, also, Walmart recently announced in the last two weeks their kind of two America strategy with Jet.com and uh, Walmart.com. So basically, from the, what the article was saying is that they looked at an electoral map of the United States, uh, the map that Trump loves so much, and looked at the red areas and said those are going to be Walmart.com areas, and looked at the blue areas and said those are going to be Jet.com areas. Now, people in the blue areas are more kind of highly densely populated areas like New York City, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Those are not places where people prefer to shop at Walmart. More times than not, they stick their nose up at Walmart saying, oh, I could never shop there. They're a terrible company. They're, they're bad news. And so they're really pushing jet in those areas because they know the Walmart name doesn't carry much weight. And then in the more kind of rural areas like Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, they're really pushing Walmart.com because people in those areas are familiar with Walmart.com, they shop at Walmart.com, they love Walmart.com, and they love Walmart in general. And so they're much more open to shop on that website. And so it's kind of interesting how they've broken up the two marketplaces and it kind of gives a clear path forward of why are Jet and Walmart.com simultaneously kind of competing against each other? Well, the reason is, is because they're not. One's going after blue areas, one's going after red areas. Um, the last thing about Walmart that kind of makes me a little bit nervous about their outlook, and I know they do this all the time, but still it doesn't make me get a good feeling in my stomach, is that they recently announced a $20 billion buyback. And so yes, it will artificially increase the price of their stock price for the mo moment, but you could be spending that $20 billion competing against Amazon you could acquire seven more jet.coms with that $20 billion. There's a lot of stuff you could do with that $20 billion to grow your business and increase your, the price of your stock kind of the natural way opposed to just buying it back and doing it the artificial way. And so something that always makes me nervous and it's Jeff Bezos says it himself is that anytime a company starts doing buybacks, they're losing. They are, they're not innovating fast enough, they're not spending their money the right way and they have too much money, they don't even know how to spend it so they just do buybacks. It's kind of a, uh, short-term thought process, but again, I, who am I to judge their decisions? Um, next, 
is Jet.com. And so I touched a little bit more into Jet.com this last one. They can kind of bend the rules where Walmart can't. So if someone like, say, Gucci or Prada wanted to sell on an e-commerce website besides Amazon.com, most likely Gucci is not going to want to sell on Walmart.com. It would ruin their brand, it would ruin their reputation, but they probably have no qualms about Jet.com. So they can kind of go into places where Walmart can't, and it's, kind of, it's a nice strategy for them because these high-end brands, these um, kind of new trendy brands that don't want to be associated with Walmart.com can still do business with them, but through the Jet name, and then they're going to distribute to the areas that are more trendy. Also, they have Walmart's cash behind them. Jet.com can do all sorts of crazy stuff marketing-wise, margin-wise. Um, one of the things I recently read was between, I think it was like September 10th and October 10th, they're giving you on Jet.com a 5% cash back on any purchase that you make on Jet.com, and you can redeem that cash back on Cyber Monday. And so one thing they're kind of doing is they can offer these big discounts because they have Walmart's cash chest behind it, but at the same time, they can do it in creative ways to drive traffic back to their platform. And so there's a lot of kind of cool things that Jet can do where they're the nimble startup inside of the big monster. And they seem to have enough autonomy that they can do kind of what they want without Walmart really bugging them. The, um, the last thing is that, again, the last article right here, the quote I have, the, the discount giant will have its youngest Jet.com e-commerce unit focused on shoppers in New York, Chicago, Boston, and other large cities where the 55-year-old online store will focus on the rest of the country. Exactly kind of what I was saying with the red and blue. They, ne they never really specifically mentioned the um, electoral map, but it's an easy way to kind of see the different demographics. So I'm semi-bullish on Jet.com, but at the same time, it has to fit with your um, brand. So if you're selling a commodity, you're selling something that's cheap, quick, easy, it might work better on Walmart.com because people are just looking for cheap, quick, easy things. Where on Jet.com, if you're selling something that's you're private labeling your own $200 leather handbags, Jet.com might make a lot more sense than Walmart.com because you may not want to devalue your brand on Walmart.com. So depending on what kind of skew you're selling, that marketplace may, different marketplaces may make more sense for you. The next e-commerce marketplace I'm going to go into, and this is the one I'm going to go into the most because I think it's the most interesting out of all of them, is Wish.com. Um, just curious, how many in this room have heard of Wish.com? All right, so everyone's on top of it. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, if I go to a normal group of 100 people, maybe three people have heard of Wish.com. And so it's an up-and-coming marketplace. It's currently valued at a little over $3 billion. It's valued at more than like Macy's, JCPenney's, and Sears combined. And it kind of seems to be the future, where if you want something super cheap and you don't really uh, mind longer shipping prices, I mean longer uh, shipping times, then Wish is for you. It's like a um, more properly vetted, kind of classier AliExpress. So we get into, there is, from a quote from, from Wish themselves, hundreds of thousands of consumers spend 30 minutes browsing products on Wish every day. Sell your products directly to consumers on their mobile devices. So two things to take away from that. First off, people just hang out on Wish's app, just shopping around looking for deals. They're selling dress shirts for $7. They're selling kitchen accessories for $1. Everything is super, super cheap on their website. And so people just chill on there for 30 minutes just looking for deals, seeing if they can find anything. Even if they're not specifically trying to buy something, they just hang out on their platform. And with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Everyone's competing for the amount of time you spend on your phone in a day, and there's limited amount of time, only 24 hours in a day. If they can already capture 30 minutes of someone's day, and they already have 100,000 people like that, that makes me very confident that they can kind of do that moving forward. On top of that, they're focusing on mobile devices. Wish.com, if you go there, it's kind of clunky, but if you go on the app, it works very, very easily. It's, um, it's again, only for specific products, it may make sense. Where if you're selling cheaper commodities or you know that you can get a super good price in China for a specific product and you want to pass that bargain on to the customer in a less competitive marketplace, for sure, Wish.com is for you. But again, if you're selling $200 leather bags that you private labeled and you've got this great brand you created over years, Wish.com is probably not the marketplace for you. You might want to just sell your wallets on there, your keychains, or smaller, kind of cheaper accessories. 
it is super, super good for drop shipping. If you're the kind of person who has a catalog from China that has 20,000 SKUs, people on Wish, opposed to Amazon, don't mind a three week, four week, five week shipping time. And so if you can just have this large catalog and you're drop shipping everything, Wish.com is the perfect marketplace for you where if you try to sit there and drop ship stuff on Amazon, you'll never get anywhere because of the buy box algorithm. But it's a completely different algorithm on Wish.com and I will show you that right here. So they break theirs down into tiers. I, um, two weeks ago I signed up for a Wish.com account just so I could kind of figure out exactly the ins and outs of it. And with Wish Express, they get all of the benefits where they get eligible faster payments, eligible Wish Express benefits, which are kind of a gray area. Now, they don't really fully explain what that means. Eligible for all-star shopper badge and boost your impressions. So if you can actually ship yourself on, your ship your products on time on Wish.com, you will kill it because you'll be in tier one and you'll get all the external benefits. If you can ship most of your stuff on time, you'll be in tier two, and then as you go down, you start losing benefits. And so two, you can have kind of a tiered approach to what you're selling, where you have a certain amount of products you can get to customers immediately, and so you stay in that tier one area. You have a certain amount of products that take 45 days, 60 days to ship to your customer, and so you're in that tier four area. And overall, as an average, you might be in the tier two area. And so it may make sense to sell certain products just to boost your tier rating. And so it's a totally kind of brand new marketplace that hasn't been exploited yet. Um, I used to sell on Etsy a lot too, and it's the same kind of thing where it seems like a lot of people don't fully understand how SEO works, a lot of people don't fully understand how keyword research works, and so while the marketplace is still young and growing like crazy, it's a good time to get in and it's your products fit that kind of um, category. Some other stuff that Wish.com is doing that's kind of interesting. I, uh, I'm a big combat sports fan, and I noticed that when you're watching the Conor McGregor Floyd Mayweather fight, which is the biggest fight in history, there was Wish.com logos everywhere. They're doing a really big push to kind of make their brand known and make them seem like a household brand. And so they're only a couple years old, but they're really trying to push kind of the mainstream effect. Another place they're starting to show up is they just sponsored the Lakers jersey for uh, $30 million. And so it's pretty interesting because they're going after Lakers while Rakuten just spent like $28 million to sponsor the Golden State Warriors. And so these kind of different e-commerce giants are trying to make sure that they kind of push their logo in front of the casual consumer's face. Because I guarantee there's maybe 75, 80% of you guys heard of Wish.com. If you go into a typical Lakers game, I'd say that maybe one, two percent of people there know what Wish.com is. And so being able to get on kind of the Lakers always playing on Christmas Day, all that kind of stuff, kind of constantly reinforcing their logo over and over again in people's faces in kind of places where normal e-commerce shoppers um, hang out, not just the kind of bargain shoppers, is going to do big things for their brand and kind of pushing their brand out there. And so I read another article saying they spent over $100 million on Facebook ads last year. And so they're venture funded. They're going to be spending money like crazy, kind of being everywhere. So don't be surprised if you start seeing Wish kind of popping up in the most random places, including uh, basketball jerseys. Here's an interesting thing as I was doing research for the presentation was um, Wish.com has, this is on MBA's website, MBA.com. Wish, they're explaining what Wish is and how it's great for the customers. They got a little video for it. And so that's kind of like a goofy thing that I didn't really expect to see, but as I was doing my research, I go, wow, if MBA.com is pushing Wish like this, this is kind of interesting. It's uh, explaining the whole business process, explaining how shipping works, explaining what kind of market they're going after. It's uh, something that a lot of e-commerce companies don't do. A lot of e-commerce companies like eBay don't explain to the customers, here's what we're good at, here's what we're bad at. Um, they kind of just say that we're good at everything, and we know that's not 100% true. So as I was talking about eBay, eBay is the one I'm the least bullish on. I say eBay as kind of like Craigslist, if you're familiar with that, where it's just not going anywhere, but it's not growing too. Where Craigslist is not going to blow up overnight, but again, it's not going anywhere. Majority of people in the US know what eBay is, know what eBay does, and know what kind of products are on eBay. You're selling baseball cards, you're selling um, collector items, you're selling at stuff where more times than not, it doesn't have a set market price, and you're trying to see what the market's willing to pay for it. Um, they're trying to really kind of revamp eBay. They're doing stuff like if you do um, over a million dollars in sales and like 
less than 10% of your sales are on eBay, they're offering you all sorts of benefits to come over to eBay because they're really trying to push and they're really trying to make sure that they're not just a second tier marketplace and they're trying to actually grow for the future. I'm not sure exactly how well that's working. Is how many people here sell on eBay? And is any of you in the last like six months or year just jumped on eBay? So a couple of you. So it's, it's doing some sort of work um, to try to get new sellers on eBay, but for the most part, it's a pretty, um, it's a saturated market, it's an old market. People kind of know what they're getting with eBay. Um, the way I've explained it in the past is for people who want to, um, like a Target shopper, if you guys are familiar with the Target stores, they're more kind of Amazon shoppers where they want a cleaner store experience, they want everything to be organized on the shelves nicely, they want their shopping experience to be pleasant, and they're willing to pay five, 10% more per item. Where the eBay shoppers are more like Walmart shoppers where they know the store is gonna be a little bit messy, they know it's gonna be a little bit more of an adventure of going through the Walmart, but they're gonna save that five, 10%, and they don't mind the adventure of going through a Walmart, even though the things aren't on the shelves properly, even though the, cust the customer service agents aren't really sure where things are stocked in the store, they don't really mind it because they know they're saving a buck. So, they, as I was saying, they're going after products more and more that are, uh, don't have a set market price, and that's why uh, a few years ago they acquired uh, StubHub.com. It kind of fits right in with their collector's items, tickets, shoes, luxury items. They're really trying to kind of sell stuff that you can't really sell at scale. It's, I know personally that uh, my brother and I sold about a million dollars on eBay in 2014, and in 2015 we said, no more eBay, because it's too difficult to scale your business on eBay. If you get a thousand orders in one day on eBay, your life's miserable. Every one of those customers is gonna be contacting you. Every one of those customers is gonna say, hey, has it shipped yet? Hey, has it shipped yet? Hey, has it shipped yet? Some of those customers might not pay you. They don't, it doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get paid if someone bought your product on eBay or won the auction. They just might not ever send you the PayPal invoice. And so that's a nightmare to scale your business on eBay. And so that's why they've kind of focused on items that aren't scalable, where if you have a limited edition um, sneaker, you're not going to be selling that sneaker uh, 100 units a day for the next 10 years, because that's not how it works. So you'd sell that kind of product on Amazon where it's more scalable and more automated. For eBay, it's kind of where I honestly go to liquidate my products. I go there to liquidate and I go there to test. If I'm selling a product that I don't know the set price, uh, example I've used in the past is um, I've sourced bamboo sunglasses. These bamboo sunglasses were going anywhere from $7 a pair to like $120 a pair on Amazon. I wasn't really sure what people thought mine were worth. I threw a bunch of them on eBay, probably 10 different auctions and with different pictures and they all kind of got bid up to about $20 to $27. So I knew, okay, this is what an average consumer, when they look at this, this is what they're willing to pay. If I can just add 10, 20% to the price and then have it prime on Amazon, that's gonna be kind of the equilibrium price for this product. And so I use eBay for testing, I use eBay for liquidating, not much else. It's pretty hard to build a uh, scalable business on it. And with wish.com, walmart.com, jet.com, amazon.com, all of these marketplaces could grow 20, 30, 40% year over year. They have that kind of um, hyper growth that can happen where I don't ever see eBay all of a sudden getting their act together and sales increasing 30% on eBay. Everyone kind of knows what they offer and it's not really going anywhere. So lastly, Amazon, where I assume most of you are very familiar with Amazon. So Amazon currently, in 2016, um, accounts for 43% of all e-commerce sales. So I, I'm very curious to see if they're gonna keep killing smaller retailers and that percentage is gonna keep growing, or if Jet, Walmart, and all of them can start eating into their um, slice. I'd be very interested to see what next year's, or what 2017's, sorry, um, percentage is, and what 2018's percentage is, to see if it's growing over time or see if it's staying stable. Because even if it stays stable, the growth of e-commerce sales in, in the US and worldwide is gonna keep growing and Amazon can just grow with that. Amazon, but it's also sourcing and branding more products themselves. I saw an article about two months ago where Amazon had registered like 150 different trademark names. 
And so not only are they doing the Amazon basics, but they're doing Amazon's own button-up shirts that have their own brand. They're doing Amazon baby products that have their own brand. And they're kind of getting into all these different things that we all predicted maybe three, four years ago that Amazon would start from the top of the list and start sourcing everything themselves. And it seems like now they're finally getting their act together and actually doing that. So it's kind of nerve wracking, but at the same time, again, they're gonna go after the highest selling, most competitive stuff first and work their way down the list. And so if you're selling something where you're providing actual value to your customer, you have your own database off of Amazon, or you're selling kind of like low competition, obscure products, it's still gonna be a while until Amazon can make its way all the way down the list and start selling those products too. Also, the um, sales tax problems are starting to keep sellers away. Amazon's more and more saying, hey, you guys actually have to pay your sales tax. Most people are only paying sales tax in the state that they're located. But according to most states, if you store your product in a Amazon fulfillment center, you technically have nexus in that state. And so I'm I'll preface this with, I'm not a tax expert, but um, more times than not, if you're not sitting there having every single fulfillment center that you have products in and collecting sales tax for it and redistributing out the sales tax, the states are gonna go after you eventually, Amazon's gonna go after you eventually, and you really need to get your act together. So this is gonna be something that as time goes on, it's really gonna scare people away. I have people contact me all the time saying, hey Will, I'm looking to get on Amazon, I wanna sell on Amazon, is, there, is it still a good enough marketplace? Am I still gonna make money? Is it too competitive now? Is Amazon just gonna source my product already and then take all my business from me? And if that's the kind of stuff that's worrying people from getting onto Amazon, it's not gonna help if they hear also, oh yeah, and you have to register for sales tax in 27 states. That's not gonna, that's gonna keep that many more sellers away. Keeping sellers away, they're gonna have to sell somewhere else, and they're probably gonna move to all these other marketplaces. And so, Amazon's slowly kind of scaring away people. On the vendor side, it's getting insane. I had a, the majority of the companies that we manage their Amazon account, they have Vendor Central accounts. And we're having stuff where, our company owns their own factory in China, and Amazon's asking for such low prices on the vendor side that they can't do it profitably. And if they're saying, hey, we're buying $10 million a year, $20 million a year out of our Chinese factory, we're producing that much product at scale, and if we can't get a price low enough for Amazon, who can? And so they're slowly squeezing out the vendors too and kind of pissing people off on that side. And so Amazon for the longest time was like the easiest, best marketplace to jump on. Anyone could sign up for it, you could jump on immediately, send an inventory into Amazon, no problem. Everything was super easy. They're slowly getting harder and harder, squeezing out the vendors, squeezing out the sellers, and I think they're eventually gonna start going more and more places. If I talked to a room like you guys, say three, four years ago, it'd be, most of you would say, I'm Amazon only, no other marketplaces. Nowadays, if I ask you guys, how many of you are selling on a different marketplace besides Amazon? So it's, it's getting there, and it's, I expect year after year it's gonna be growing more and more because it makes sense to diversify, and Amazon is not being very, uh, very nice to you. They basically, last point, care about the customers, care about the customer experience, nothing else. They don't care about themselves. They rarely make a profit as a company. They don't care about you as a seller. They don't care about their vendors. All they care about is making their customers happy. If they can make their customers happy, then they've done their job and it will make them money in the long run. But making their customers happy doesn't make us happy always and actually kind of pisses us off most of the time. So, back to kind of the first bullet point. Variety of products. This is great for companies like Jet.com, Walmart.com, Amazon.com, and that's about it. If you have every single style of a specific polo shirt, oh, oh, if you have every specific style of a polo shirt like this that comes in blue with a yellow guy, yellow with a blue guy, and all those different skews and all those different combinations, it doesn't really make sense for you to put them on eBay because you're gonna have to manage all these different listings and it's gonna be kind of a nightmare. But if you had all of these in a big parent-child on Amazon, or you had them all for sale on Walmart or Jet, it's only going to increase your conversion rate. It's only going to make the customer happy that they don't have to click out of your listing and click into a bunch of listings to see all the different colors and sizes. They're in one place. They see all the colors and sizes. They see all the prices. It makes it very easy for the shopper. So the variety of products, the people who are going to win on this are Jet, Walmart, and Amazon. The one-click checkout is something that I expect 
all of the companies to get into very soon. It only makes sense. With Amazon's patent running out, everyone knows that the less friction you make the buyers go through, the more they're going to buy. And so it really makes sense over time that basically everyone's going to have a one-click checkout button. And soon I can even imagine um, there might be a one-click checkout company that has an API so you can sit there and add it to your Shopify store and add it to anywhere because it really makes sense. If you had a one-click checkout on your Twitter ad, on your Instagram ad, and all these different kind of social media, Facebook ads, it really could drive conversions opposed to clicking on a Facebook ad, going to a landing page, giving your email, clicking through the landing page, sending them to Amazon, then a one-click checkout. You're already making the customer click five times before they purchase a product. Every time they click something else, you're giving them a chance to click off to somewhere else and shop somewhere else. So one-click checkout's gonna be huge, and I think all of the e-commerce marketplaces are gonna adopt that very quickly. The low price, I see that is something that eBay and um, Wish.com are really gonna dominate. Amazon does a good job with low price, and they're probably the next one after those two, but basically price is just a result of competition. People don't lower their prices just to lower their prices. They lower their prices because the rest of the market's lowering their prices, or because they're trying to win a buy box. If a seller was selling an item, they're the only one selling that item, and there's no one competing for the buy box, they're gonna try to sell it for as much money as possible. It doesn't make sense, and so making it so all these new vendors come onto Walmart.com, onto Jet.com, is really gonna drive the prices down and everyone's gonna have low prices. Fast and free shipping, this is where Jet's gonna win and Amazon's gonna win. Walmart's still gonna probably take a little bit of time because they're gonna be going to the rural areas, places where they don't have distribution centers nearby, and so it's gonna take them longer to get the cheap and fast shipping. Same with Wish, the whole point of Wish is that they have cheap products but the shipping takes forever, so they're probably not gonna get into the free and fast shipping anytime soon. So this is really a place where um, Jet and Amazon are gonna dominate. eBay, again, the shipping kind of depends on the vendor, so it's not something I'd hold my breath for. So, as you kind of look at the landscape of the marketplaces, really think about each e-commerce marketplace, what products make the most sense there, what customers shop there, why do the customers shop there, and kind of make a holistic decision of where does it actually make sense to sell your products. It may not make sense just to spam your products over all the different e-commerce marketplaces all over the world. But if you can find the specific ones where your specific customer avatar kind of hangs out, that can really help you and really make sure that you don't waste a bunch of time and money getting onto Walmart.com when your product's not a Walmart product, or getting onto Jet.com when it's not a Jet product. Make sure you really kind of keep that in mind, and if you can keep in mind that customer avatar, you can make sure that you sell in the marketplace that makes sense and don't waste your time anywhere else. So that's the end of the presentation. Here's my uh, Twitter and Instagram. Here's my email if you guys have any questions. And uh, throwing it off at the end. Um, offering $200 an hour um, for Skype calls for one-on-one -on -one consulting with your business opposed to the usual 300 and just contact me in my email and say hey I was at the Global Sources Summit would love to chat with you and we can schedule a time and figure something out. Wow thank you Will. Awesome. <laughs>